a mighty good evening to everyone out there. I'm Pastor Rick at New Life Christian Assembly of God in Haverhill, Mass. And we are on Wednesday night in the Word for the next hour. So God bless you all. Thank you for signing on here. Uh, let me just take a moment here to see who's here. All right, I'm going to go down the list right now. So I see 11 people up here. And I see Tony in New Jersey. I see Joe Francella in Florida. Hey, Joe, how you doing? James Carter, Dolores, uh, Lorinda, and Sandy. Boy, you two are so faithful. Thank you for being here. Pastor Bill is here. Angela is here. And, uh, okay, Pauline is here. Pamela, my dear wife, is here. And uh, Sandy Whitney is here as well. So very good. Well, I greet you in Jesus' name. I trust everyone's having a good day. It was a little cool this morning uh, when I went out of the house early. Um, yeah, it was a little chilly. I think it was in the 50s last night, but it warmed up pretty good today. It was a good day. Hey, Danica, God bless you. Uh, so I was wondering if... Um, I just wondered how everyone was doing today. Oh, yeah, thank you, Angela. Uh, if you could hit your share button, that would be great. Uh, get it on your page. We may pick up a few people. Uh, I'd love to have 30 people on here tonight. Uh, that may be a little, a little ambitious, but um, I think we could do it, you know, especially with the Lord's help. Um, so how is everyone? I, I was thinking, I mean, I'm ready to teach. You know, I have, a, I have my notes. I did all my preparation this afternoon and uh, I, I really enjoy the study in Romans. Uh, we've been doing this for the past six years now. Uh, oh, Pastor Bill. <laughs> Pastor Bill, you, you need to live in Florida, I think. It's hot down there. <laughs> he let, the hotter the better for Pastor Bill. Oh, I think those hot days are coming, by the way. Uh, it's still June. I mean, you know, June is a little iffy. But once July and August come, it will be hot in Massachusetts for sure. Um, but I was wondering if, if I wasn't prepared to, to teach tonight, I wonder what everyone would like to talk about. So, I mean, I'm going to just, I'm going to start going here, but I, I just wonder if you had any, any things on your mind that you might want to discuss or any questions you might have about some of our past studies or whatever's going on. Uh, if you wanted to just, just make a, you know, start a conversation. How, how would you like to start a conversation tonight? Uh, <laughs> the weather, yeah. The weather, uh, Sandy, yeah, Sandy, I saw your, your comment, I think on Facebook, that um, it was chilly this morning, but you liked it. And uh, yeah, it, it really, I really felt good, you know, to me anyway. I was out early. I was out, uh, what time was I out? I don't know, seven or so. Uh, Angela, forgiveness. Forgiveness is a big issue. Yes, it is. Um, forgiveness, wow. I mean, there's a correlation between the way we forgive others and the way God forgives us. Uh, we see that in several scriptures. Uh, we are forgiven of our sins. And so, hey, Jerry Ellis, God bless you. And uh, we are called upon by the Lord to forgive others of their sins against us. Or That's probably, a, in some cases, difficult to forgive people, especially when we're hurt and it's unjustified. Um but Jesus said, oh, Peter asked Jesus, how many times do we forgive? And Jesus said, you know, in essence, he was saying, you just keep on forgiving people because that's a characteristic of being a Christian is uh, living in and being forgiven by the Lord and forgiving others that have wronged you as well. I'm not saying it's easy, um, but um, it's something that we're called to do. Forgiveness, forgiveness. So uh, on that note, why don't we open up in prayer? Uh, we do have a few people to pray for. Um, I'll just mention them as we get started. Uh, talk about having the power of the Holy Spirit within us. Dunamis power, that's right. 
Well, Acts 1.8 says that when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you shall receive power to be my witnesses uh, in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the outermost parts of the world. Um, the Holy Spirit is definitely uh, definitely someone that we need. Note, note that I said someone, not something, but someone. We need the person of the Holy Spirit in our, in our lives. And... Uh, that, that anointing of the Holy Spirit does give us the power to carry on. I mean, when you think about the early church and those, uh, those 11 disciples and then Judas's replacement, the 12, and all those 3,000 converts and, and so on, uh, so many believers um, were persecuted, ridiculed, mocked, thrown in jail, killed for their faith. But because they had the Holy Spirit, they were able to continue. I always think about that, like in our, in our situation here in the States, um, sometimes we think life is so hard and life is so difficult here. Uh, it's nothing like it was in the first century, for sure. Um, I mean, we may get a little ridicule, things may be difficult at times, we may feel spiritual oppression, which, yeah, we do. But uh, we have the Holy Spirit, and that's when we can say, you know, greater is He that is in us. And he that's in the world, the Holy Spirit makes us powerful, makes us able to deal with life and crisis and demonic forces as well. Um, so, yeah, well, we have the Holy Spirit and we will continue to trust the Holy Spirit to, to carry on. Uh, okay, just see, uh, Sandy Wayne was away. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, hey, Maria, good to see you from Puerto Rico. Um Oh, James Carter. Wait, I'm going to get to that in one minute. Uh, sometimes we forgive others more than ourselves. Ozzy Pauline had a statement. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass. Yeah, could you, could you, Pauline made a good statement up here. <clears throat> Lord, forgive us our, from the Lord's Prayer, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Wow, so if it's conditional, uh, <laughs> we better start forgiving people, you know, because that's the way the Lord's going to forgive us. Uh, Sandy said, sometimes we forgive others more than ourselves, so uh, it doesn't weigh down on us with the junk of the world. Yep, yep, yep. Uh, and we need to forgive ourselves, too. Uh, we will pray for your nephew, Brian, Jerry. And uh, let's see. Um, all right. Pray for this cough. Angela has a cough. Yeah, we'll be praying for that cough. So we'll pray for Angela. We'll pray for Jerry's nephew, Brian, uh, Brian, I think. Where to go? Yeah, Brian. And let's see, James had a statement here. How about a lesson on the topic of the recent membership letter? Woo-hoo! Uh, responsibilities and expectations of members and congregants. What is a member and, and congregants' role in the church and in the community? Well, that is a very important subject. And I did send out a letter to all of our members now, in our church, uh, we probably are 50-50. 50 50% uh, 50 are members, official members that went through membership class and are committed to be here. And another 50% are, are coming, attending faithfully, some not so faithfully, but just coming when they can. And that arrangement is fairly typical of many Assembly of God churches. Uh, but the responsibilities of membership, uh, first of all, is to be in church, <laughs> you know, uh, second of all, to pray for the church, to support the leaders and the, the, the elders of the church, and, uh, and to tithe and bring your offering to the church, um, and, to, and to fill in various uh, roles, uh, various responsibilities that have to be met, like uh, members are the ones that teach and uh, lead other ministries and so forth. Uh, right now, we're, we're seriously looking for some helpers with Kids Church. We're trying to get that off the ground again. Uh, so we need some volunteers to help out with that. Um, yeah, so James, that might be a lesson that we could do one time, like, like devote the whole time to it. That would be kind of interesting. Uh, if you did get a letter from me uh, and you are a member of the church, make sure you return that letter. Fill out the back of it. Let us know your intentions. And uh, we want to update our membership roster uh, before we go too much farther here. So anyway, all right, uh, let me pray. Let me pray for those needs. Uh, dear Father, we pray your blessing upon Wednesday night in the Word. Uh, we pray for Jerry's uh, 
nephew Brian, he has sciati a sciatica problem. We just pray for divine healing for him in Jesus' name. We pray for Angela, Lord, uh, for healing of her cough that's been lingering for a while. If it's allergies or whatever it is, Lord, bring healing to her body in the name and authority of Jesus. And Lord, we want to pray for uh, some people here at our fellowship, for Gary Feldman, uh, now in New York, uh, getting the treatments that he needs for his uh, health problems. We pray for Joanne, uh, for continued healing and strength for her. We pray for uh, Adri Adrian Velez for just protection as he goes through the chemo uh, regarding his cancer. We pray for healing. For Hugh Hutchinson, same thing. We pray for healing of cancer. Uh, for Millie Cobbett, healing of her knee replacement surgery. We pray for John Eastwood, Sandy Whitney, uh, Katie Lund, Stacey Amendola Johnson, and anyone else, Lord, that may be sick right now. We just pray for healing and strength for them in Jesus' name. Father, we lift up Leaving the Streets Ministry as they get ready for their uh, block party this coming Saturday at Cashman Field in Haverhill. We pray, Lord, that every need would be met. Every worker would, uh, would arrive there ready to do what they need to do. We pray, Lord, for there to be no uh, problems in the park, no injuries from all the activities, and that the Word of God would be proclaimed and many would come to know you in a personal way due to that outreach. And Lord, we also pray for new life for this Sunday as, um, as the uh, New England Teen Challenge uh, men come to minister here at our church in both morning services. We pray, Lord, for your blessing over their ministry, their testimonies, their songs, and the word of God that will be preached. We pray, Lord, for our youth group that's having a cookout at 5. We pray for our prayer meeting at 6. And we pray for the water baptism at 7 to be a glorious time uh, for new believers. So bless our Sunday, Lord, coming up. Lord, now we just pray your blessing over tonight's study. Uh, we welcome your Holy Spirit to, uh, to guide us and to teach us what we need to know. And we thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Hallelujah. Amen and amen. All right, so if you could hit your, uh, sh your share button, that would be great. Uh, oh, Alinda, I didn't see that till right now. I'll pray for you. Uh, yes, thank you, Pamela. Hey, Jeannie Ellis. All right. Um, <laughs> Jerry Ellis says he's an internet member. Uh, we do have some uh, long distance members, well, not official, but we call them members. Uh, those that are not, uh, um, you know, not here in person, but they are part of our church through the internet, which is great. There, there's several that are in that category. Uh, let's pray for Alinda. Father, we just pray for Alinda. Uh, Lord, healing and strength for her in Jesus' name. Lord, strengthen her body, soul, and spirit. Uh, let tonight's study be good for her in, uh, in every way. And uh, we just welcome your Holy Spirit upon her in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Amen and amen. All right. Well, okay, so we are in Romans 15. And uh, I think we can maybe, I mean, theoretically, we can, we can complete the chapter. We're going to start at verse 14 tonight. We ended around verses 14, 15 last time. Um, and again, not to be redundant, but 15 is a continuation of 14. And uh, 14, of course, is about, um, you know, Paul's teaching to the church there in Rome, not to, not to sweat over the little things, basically. Of course, I'm paraphrasing. But uh, there's new believers in the fellowship that, were, that have some cultural differences, some... Um, some uh, social differences and... and and the, the ones that were in the church were kind of criticizing them and, and, uh, and causing more of a problem than it was worth. And so the, that theme, Paul corrects them, um, and he, he continues it in verse, uh, chapter 15. Verse 14, he kind of switches gears a little bit. Hey, Eva Rogers, God bless. Um, where he says in verse okay, 15, 14, I myself am, am confident concerning you, my brethren, that you also are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, able also to admonish one another. The thought is, after, say, verses uh, in 14, verse 10 and verse 13, where he was really kind of getting on their case that they were contemptuous 
uh, verse 13, uh, they were judgmental. Uh, now he's saying here in 15, 14, he's saying, look, I, I love you. I'm confident in you. Um, uh, I, he calls them my brethren to reassure his commitment to them in spite of the correction. Um, I know that you're full of goodness and, and knowledge and you're able to admonish one another. So he says, I, I know that you're able to handle my correction and you're able to heal, uh, handle the new believers that are, that are coming into the church. But what a good problem to have, by the way, that there are new people coming to the church in Rome and they have differences. But what would they do if they didn't have any new people coming? That would be a different problem. And they'd have another discussion about that. But in verse 15, he says, Nevertheless, um, nevertheless, uh, even though I know that you're able to work this out, uh, he said, he, I'm going to paraphrase verse 15, I've written more boldly to you because uh, this is my calling. This is my this is my call in life. He refers to it as the grace given to me by God. Because of the grace given to me by God, in other words, because of my calling uh, to be a leader, an overseer, a pastor, I've got to do what I just did. I've got to do you know, what I do. Um, so again, let's go back. Uh, 14 verse 10, he says, Why do you judge your brother? Why do you show contempt for your brother? And in verse 13, he says, Therefore, let us not judge one another, but let's resolve this. Don't put a stumbling block or cause one to fall, uh, to call, cause a brother to fall. Um, so he's saying, you know, uh, you're, you could handle it, and, and you could handle me too, because, um, because of the grace given to me by God. Uh, that phrase uh, is used a few times. Um, if we look back in chapter 1, verse 5, it says, uh, Through him we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all the nations of his name. So Paul's saying, look, by, by God's grace, I've, I've become an apostle. This is my calling. Uh, chapter 12, in verse 3, he says basically it's something else. He says, uh, Through the grace given to me, uh, to everyone who is among you, don't think of yourself more highly than you should. Um, so, you know, by the grace given to Paul, he, he, he is called to be a minister of the gospel. So I want to take a few minutes and talk about his calling. Um, and let me see what Sandy says here. This is very painful. It's not a cure, but a spray. Oh, biofreeze. All right. All right, I think that's going to uh, Jerry Ellis. Okay, about the about Brian. Okay, so um, Paul's calling. Paul refers to his calling as the grace of God. Um, in Acts nine, uh, the Damascus Road experience. Um, Ananias came to visit with Paul, but in verse number, let's see, Acts nine, verse thirteen. Uh, Ananias said, Lord, I've heard many about this man, how much harm he has done. Uh, but the Lord says, Ananias, I want you to go minister to him. And the Lord said to Ananias in verse 15, Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles, <clears throat> before kings, and before the children of Israel. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. And um, so... So Paul is called to be a minister. Uh, he did minister greatly to the Gentiles. Uh, we see this uh, through his mission trips through the book of Acts. We also know that he had a great burden for Israel from uh, Romans 9, uh, 9, 10, and 11, actually. But Romans 9 talks about how, how valuable the Jews were in Christianity because through them came the Messiah, came the law, came the word, came the prophets. And so he had a he had a, a burden for you know both Gentile and Jew, uh, although he is referred to as the apostle to the Gentiles. Peter is more or less referred to the apostle to the Jews, but they did have contact with both. 
Uh, the theme of, of the book of Romans here is Romans 1, 16 and 17. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes, whether Jew, to the Jew first or also to the Greek. Uh, for in it, in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. And so he was called to be a minister, called to be a leader, called to be an apostle, called to be a missionary, called to be a pastor. Uh, but something about this is really interesting, I think. Uh, in 2 Timothy 3, let's look at a couple of things. I touched on this a little bit on Sunday during the Father's Day message. But 2 Timothy 3.10 uh, okay. uh, Paul writes to Timothy, uh, You have carefully followed my doctrine um, and my manner of life, my purpose, my faith, my long-suffering, my love, my perseverance, my persecution, my afflictions, which happened to me at Antioch and how the Lord you know, delivered me from all of them. But there's something about, about Paul's style. In 1 Thessalonians 2.8, which I shared on Sunday during the Father's Day message, uh, 1 Thessalonians 2.8, uh, Paul says, I, we shared the gospel and we shared our lives with you. It wasn't just the gospel and it wasn't just our lives, but uh, Paul had a, had a way of incorporating the gospel with his life. And uh, this is where the human element comes in. Um, it's like, as I was saying on Sunday, we can't give our children the gospel and not give them our lives. Um, that would be very rigid, very controlling, very legalistic. You know, this is it, but you're never going to get close to my heart. Uh, thank you, Lorinda. I appreciate that so much. That means a lot right there. Um, and it's in the same manner, we Christians, when we share the gospel with people, it can't just be like a cut and dry, you know, gospel. It's got to be a gospel that's, that's covered with, with our passion and our compassion. Um, this is what Jesus did. He gave, he gave his life. He gave the gospel, uh, with his life. I mean, there is a, you know, uh, an analogy there. Jesus gave the gospel with his life, and we must do the same thing. Paul, Paul is saying here, whenever I gave the gospel, I gave my life too. And, and that seems to be the way it is. You know? So for a pastor, uh, like for instance, in my case, I, I give the gospel, but you know, my goodness, I, I give my life away. <laughs> I, I give, uh, you know, the preaching is uh, an hour on a Sunday and uh, an hour on a Wednesday night and whatever I, else I do. In that way which is very important I'm not downplaying that but it's all the other stuff where my life is being poured out you know my, my time my energy my thoughts my prayers uh, my anguish over certain things with people uh, you know I feel I feel what people feel that that's what that's what all Christians should do not just pastors by the way uh, so yeah so um, let's go over to 2nd Corinthians chapter 11 Everyone, everyone with me here tonight? Let's see, how many, got 17 people here? Okay, uh, 2 Corinthians <coughs> chapter 11. Uh, these are Paul's sufferings. And uh, the last suffering, or the, the last burden, is, is very important, I think. Hey, Aaron Evans is here. God bless you, Aaron. Uh, thank you, James. You're, you're absolutely right about that. And James knows all too well about Saturday nights and getting the uh, sermon outlined together. Um, yeah, so a sermon for me, a typical Sunday sermon, takes like every day during the week thinking about it. <laughs> and then Saturday putting it on paper at, in an outline form. And I, that usually is from like, say, 12 noon till eight o'clock at night and then a little review after that and then another review in the morning so yeah it, it's a it takes a while my Wednesday night prep is Wednesday afternoon but anyway okay uh, so anyway so Paul's given his life but in 2nd Corinthians 
11, he says um, in verse number 24, he says, From the Jews, five times I, I received 40 stripes minus one. 39. <laughs> Three times I was beaten with rods, once I was stoned, three times I was shipwrecked, a night and a day I was in the deep. Not sure what that means other than being at sea. Uh, in journeys often, all his travels, in perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils of the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, and perils among false brethren, in weariness and toil and sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst and fastings often, in cold and nakedness. And what I wanted to get to was here. Besides the other things, what comes upon me daily, dot, dot, my deep concern for all the churches. Uh, so my deep concern for the Christians that I minister to. So, Paul, you know, it's not just like you can give the gospel and then forget it. You know, I mean, you know, when you really think about what you're giving, you're giving a, a powerful uh, entity of the good news of Jesus Christ, that he has come to save sinners, and someone's eternal destination is in the balance. So how, how could it be? that we would just take it lightly and, and keep it cold. You can't, can't keep it cold. It's got to be a heart issue. Um, and so anyway, that's, what, that's what Paul is saying in Romans 15, where am I? Romans 15 that um, I, I've written to you, you know, and I, I've corrected you because this is my calling to correct. Now, let me just, let me digress for another moment <laughs> because in my life in ministry, hey, Patty Stauffer, glad you made it. Uh, there are many times when I will have to speak to someone and give them biblical guidance and, you know, um, uh, and for the most part, people are really good and they want to hear what the Bible says. Uh, except when they're steeped in sin and they're rebellious and they don't want to hear it. Then they get mad at the giver of the news. Not, not, they don't get mad at God so much. They get mad at the, at the person who gives them the news. And I've had some uncomfortable situations over the years where people, you know, didn't want to hear what I had to say or, or didn't want to receive it or uh, thought it was too personal or I was speaking personally. when I, I was speaking personally, but I was speaking personally, from the Word of God, and um, it, it's just a difficult situation sometimes. Now, when it goes well, it's the best thing in the world, but when it goes, when it goes sour, uh, it breaks a pastor's heart. It just, it just breaks it. I don't know any pastor that uh, hasn't, had moment, has, hasn't had nights where he's lost sleep or, or, or several nights or, or days where he would just walk around being so concerned about a situation because it's not just the gospel, it's our life, it's our, you know, it's the whole package. Anyway, uh, one more thing here. This is how important what Paul is saying is. 1 Peter 5, um, 1 Peter 5, Peter is talking about shepherds uh, and the good shepherd. But uh, the, the shepherds are, are to flock the church of God, you know. Um, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly serving, eagerly serving, not lording it over them, being examples to them. But all that's good, but, but it's, I, I call this, being a, a, a church leader is crown worthy. Because Peter says, when you, when you do that, when, the, when, you, when you serve the Lord in your calling the proper way, like Paul did, uh, Peter's saying the same thing. You, you will receive a crown. Uh, it says uh, you will, re will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. When the chief shepherd comes and appears, you will receive a crown of glory. And so that's how valuable what Peter's talking about is. Um, did you make that connection? So Peter's saying in, in Romans 15, 
you can handle yourselves, but I, I have to correct you and speak into your life. That's my calling. And my calling is very important because God's going to see how I do and hopefully I'll get a crown of glory when he comes back. And that, that's how valuable and how important the input of a church leader is in our lives. And so that's pretty good, you know. So uh, as, as such here, back in Romans 15, um, let me read uh, verse number 16 as well. Never, uh, 15 and 16. Nevertheless, brethren, I've written more boldly to you on some points. Yeah, because you were too judgmental and showed contempt to these new believers. Uh, as reminding you because of the grace given to me, because of my calling. Notice it's the grace given to me by God. You know, he's not a self-appointed leader. God appointed him and it was confirmed by the other brethren. Uh, verse 16, that I might be a minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles. Acts 9, that, that was his calling. Ministering the gospel of God, that the offering of the Gentiles, or, or the lives of the Gentiles, the, 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 uh, the, uh, the Christian life of the Gentile, uh, might be acceptable and sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Now, he uses that word sanctified, which rings a bell in my ear, that in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, after Paul speaks to the uh, Corinthians uh, about who will not inherit the kingdom of God, you know, thieves and murderers and adulterers and homosexuals and all these uh, revilers, all these terrible people, they won't inherit the kingdom of God. And then he says in 1 Corinthians 6, 11, and such were some of you, but you were washed and you were uh, sanctified and you were justified in the name of the Lord, by the work of the Holy Spirit. So he's saying here that, that my desire is that you, in verse 16, would be sanctified by the Holy Spirit. So sometimes uh, there is uh, um, there is the, the, a, 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 a companionship between the Holy Spirit and the leader to bring about certain things in a person's life where they would have to address them, where they can become sanctified. Now, it would be, it would be wonderful if the Holy Spirit did that without the, uh, the role of the pastor slash teacher. But we already know from, let's say, Ephesians 4 and other passages that the role of the pastor slash teacher is part of the plan, just like the role of the local church is part of the plan. Uh, how many people uh, have a problem with that? You know, they don't like to be part of a low, they don't, they don't like to be part of one church. They want to go here, there, and everywhere on a whim every Sunday morning. And that's, you know, okay, but that's not the biblical style that we see uh, in, in the early church. The biblical style of the early church was just be committed to a church. Whatever one you go to, just go to one, whether it's in Rome or Corinth or Philippi or Ephesus or wherever it is, just go. That's, that's your church. Um, so we live in a culture, but I, I don't think we're the only um, generation that had to deal with I think every generation had to deal with this. Uh, people don't want to come to church. They don't want to get committed to a church. They don't want to be committed to one pastor. Um, ah, I say it all the time. It's, you know... I mean, some of the some of the preachers on TV, I'm sure they have a, a good a good message, um, but when you're sick, you know those those guys aren't going to come visit you. When you're having a problem somewhere, uh, those guys aren't going to come out here to see you. Um, okay, let me just take a minute here. I'm getting ahead of myself, Sandy. I, I hear what you're saying here, Gary, and. Uh, all right. I'm look. I'm reading your post about when you were at. Uh, let's see. I don't know where you were. I thought you were at McDonald's, but maybe not. Uh, you were. You were sharing the word with Gary and Joanne, and then Sandy. You said when you preach the word, you don't. I don't directly peg one person. <laughs> I hope not. Uh, Jesus leads you to say what you have to say. Yeah, that's right. Uh, all right. 
Thank you, Sandy. I appreciate that. Uh, many are afraid of commitment today. Yeah, so, you know, but the thing is, you know, we all know the scripture that the, the, from Hebrews, the, the uh, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Um, the, the word of God, you know, the flowers fade, the grass withers, but the word of God lasts forever. Um, you know, these are biblical principles that aren't going to go away, no matter what our culture says, you know. The local church is important, the pastor is important, the teachers are important, local church is important, and so on and so forth, and that's the way it goes. Okay, so where are we now? 736. All right, so uh, verse number 17, he says, um, Therefore, I have reason to glory in Christ Jesus in the things which pertain to God. I have reason to glory in Christ Jesus in the things which pertain to God. So I have reason to glory because I know that God's at work in the church in Rome. That's what he's saying. Uh, I'm not glorying in myself. I'm glorying in the bigger picture that God's doing something incredible here. Uh, probably going back to, let's say, Romans 14. Uh, thank you, Jerry Ellis. Yeah, there you go, Sandy. Thank you. I thought it was McDonald's. <laughs> All right. Um, Romans 14, 3 and 4. Remember, the, the people there, in verse 3, God has received them. Verse number 4 of chapter 14, God has made, will make them able to stand. And these are people that were eating foods that were different, uh, had different holidays and stuff. But... Um, Paul saying, I'm, I'm seeing God doing a great, a great work uh, among the church. Hey, Edna Unger, God bless you. And Bill Unger, good to see you on here. Uh, so, it, I call it the Philippians 1 6 principle that he who began, I know James Carter, this is one of your favorites. He who began a good work in you is faithful to complete that work until the day. Uh, so, Paul saying, Look, I, I, you, you guys in Rome, you got a great church. You know, have a little bump in the road here with these new believers, but you know, lighten up on them. You can do it. You can handle it. I'm exercising my authority as the pastor and overseer, and uh, he who began a good work is faithful to complete the work. So just continue on. Uh, so that phrase, let's see, the, uh, in verse 17, I have reason to glory in Christ Jesus in the things which pertain to God. Now that phrase... It's kind of like the phrase uh, in verse number 15, because of the grace given to me, that means Paul's calling. In verse 17, the things which pertain to God uh, is a phrase. If we go to Hebrews uh, chapter 2 and chapter 5, let's see Hebrews 2.17, uh, therefore... Um, in all things, Jesus had to be made like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God. There's that phrase again. And then in Hebrews 5, verse 1, every high priest taken from among men is appointed for men in things pertaining to God, that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices. So let's, let's just, so in, in Romans 15, 17, I have reason to glory in Christ Jesus in the things which pertain to God. So Paul's just staying on track is what he's doing. Um, uh, I, I hear you, Sandy, but we appreciate you. Um, the things that pertain to God. See, as, as opposed to, in context, in chapter 14, what kind of foods you eat. That really doesn't pertain to God. Uh, what holidays you celebrate. It really doesn't pertain to God, unless it violates something, but <clears throat> apparently it didn't. Again, these aren't doctrinal issues. Paul's just saying, I, I rejoice in the things that pertain to God. So we need to keep it spiritual. You know, that, that's the point of what Paul's saying. We need to, you know, rejoice over the things that God is doing. Not that any one person is doing, not what the leadership is doing, but Rejoice and be excited about what God is doing. And, and God was doing a lot in the Roman church. 
uh, as opposed to Paul taking any, any credit for it himself. Let me read a comment. This is my uh, Full Life Study Bible book. I think, Jerry Ellis, you have one of those. Oh, Sandy, thank you for mentioning my son. I meant, I meant to say to everyone, today's our son Jeffrey's birthday. Uh, he's down in Durham, North Carolina. His name is Jeffrey Amendola. Uh, he's 38 years young, and uh, he's a great guy. We love him. We're going to see him uh, for a few weeks in September. We're going to go down there. But uh, yeah, Jeffrey's birthday. You may want to check him out on Facebook. You can wish him a happy birthday on Facebook. That would be great. So anyway, uh, Full Life Study Bible. Just a little note on, uh, <clears throat> on Romans 15, 17. Uh, it says, um, Paul says, I have reason to glory. Or some translations say, uh, I have reason to boast in what Christ did. See, and people get a little nervous about that word. Uh, but anyway, this comment says, It is not wrong to speak excitedly and joyfully about what God is doing through us if it is done in a spirit of humility and thankfulness to God. Glorying, glory -y, glorying <laughs> should not be in mere numbers, but in a ministry that produces the obedience of faith in word and deed, in that issues from a genuine work, the manifestation of the Holy Spirit in power. So, yeah, so they're making a distinction. Uh, we, you know, we don't rejoice in numbers. Okay, we don't rejoice in numbers. We rejoice in, we don't rejoice in quantity. We rejoice in quality. Right? That's what, that's what Paul is saying here. That's what the, uh, the commentary in the Full Life Study Bible say. We, we rejoice in the quality of what God is doing, not in the quantity, although there may be a large quantity. There may or may not. That's not the point. The point is we rejoice in what God is doing, whether it's bigger or small in number. And uh, that's always important to remember. Um, yeah, so... So Paul's being very careful here, verses 17, 18, and 19. Um, I'm going to read 17, 18, and 19 in just a minute. But um, he's being very careful not to bring any praise to himself. Uh, because I think, I think in times past, especially from the Corinthians, he was criticized about some things. Well, if you read 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, there's a lot of tongue-in-cheek going on in Paul's writings when he, he calls him out on a certain thing and he tries to keep it light, but he's making his points as well. And here he's trying to be very clear. He, he's glorying, he's, he's proud, he's happy, but not, not in what he did, but in what God did through him and what God is doing through the church there. Because if he was to glory in what he did, we, we read what he did, he was shipwrecked, he was hungry, he was starving, he was lost at sea. Uh, he was whipped 39 times. Uh, he had all these, he was in perils. He had all these problems and issues. There's nothing to glorify in himself. Uh, in spite of all of that, God used him to, to produce good fruit in the kingdom of God. And that should really should be our position too. I mean, today, can, can I just say this again? <laughs> there are so many in, in Western Christendom, Christendom so many Christians in America, and you may know them, I know them personally, that they, they equate you know, God's blessing on their lives with, with how much they have, how much money they have, uh, how much, uh, how, well, what new home they have, what experiences they have. Um, when it's really, I mean, man, you, you could stretch it to go that way, but I, I think about the poor guy, you know, that's in a hospital, that, that's really sick and that has no money and no family, but he's a Christian by golly. He's serving the Lord. I mean, if we, if we really think that the blessing of God comes in, in ways that are material, we are totally off of base, off base. I mean, think about it. All those 12 apostles, the replacement of, for Judas, they were all killed for their faith. John 
uh, was was uh, exiled to Patmos, but there's a a church history theory that he came back to Ephesus where he died eventually uh, a natural of natural causes. Another th another theory is that he was boiled in a pot of hot oil or something. Uh, but where's the prosperity there? You know, what about Paul? What about Peter being crucified upside down? Um, so if we're going to judge God's favor upon us by how much we get, we're wrong. We're sorry. We're, we're barking up the wrong tree. That's not the God of the Bible. That's a different, a different God. So anyway, um, let me read verses 17, 18, and 19. Then I want to talk about that. Um, 17, I, I have reason to glory in Christ Jesus in the things which pertain to God. For I will not dare to speak of any of those things which Christ has not accomplished through me, in word and deed, to make the Gentiles obedient. Mighty signs and wonders by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and round about to Illyricum, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. Paraphrase. I wrote it down. I will, verse 18, I will only boast in what Christ did through me, not what I did on my own, without Christ, in word or deed, to make the Gentiles obedient. Through manifestations, through signs and wonders, and the power of the Holy Spirit, I travel from Jerusalem to Illyricum, fully preaching the gospel of God. Now, if we, if we were to go to 1 Corinthians 2, uh, we would read there, as Paul said, I, you know, when I came to you, I didn't come to you with, with fluent speech and flowery language. Uh, I came to you in fear and trepidation, preaching Jesus Christ and him crucified. Uh, I didn't come with great eloquence. Uh, I came, let, let me read it to you. Uh, 1 Corinthians 2 it says, I, I came to you not with excellence of speech or wisdom declaring to you the testimony of God. I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. Now, if people said that today, they'd say, man, you have no faith. You know, every every preacher, every teacher, everyone who does anything for God, you're supposed to be bold and and, and have a word, and, and be, be rich. Well, I don't know about that, but Paul's saying, look, I was with you in weakness. When I was with you in Corinth, I was weak, I was fearful, and I was trembling. And my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human uh, wisdom, but they were demonstrated by the Spirit and the power, so that your faith would be built upon Jesus Christ and the Word of God, not by my persuasiveness. And you know what? The more I think about it, there's a lot of that going on in our country where people are building their churches and building the kingdom of God, but they're building it upon a personality. And there are some great speakers and great uh, administrators and great uh, men and women that are doing great things, but, but they're, they're more or less making it flowery to build these great ministries, and the Word of God, unfortunately, is being compromised in many cases. So, when Paul says, I traveled from Jerusalem to uh, Illyricum, that's a figurative phrase to say, I've been all over the place. I've traveled at three missions trips. I traveled all over. Um, in fact, uh, let's see. Let's let's go a little bit forward here. Verse twenty three. It says. Um, let's see. Verse twenty three of chapter fifteen. I no longer have a place in these parts. Remember, in chapter sixteen, verses one and two, he was writing from uh, Chenchrea, which is a part of Corinth. So he was in Corinth writing this letter to the Romans. And in fifteen twenty three, he says, "I have. I don't have a place to stay here anymore." I have a great desire to see you. For many years, I wanted to come see you. So whenever I go to Spain, I'll come to you. I hope to see you on my journey, to be helped by you on my way there and enjoy your company. But right now, I'm going to Jerusalem to minister to the saints. So Paul was definitely a traveler. Um you know, his, his main mission in life was to tell as many people as he could 
about uh, you know about the gospel of Jesus Christ, how it changed his life, how it could change anyone's life, Jew or Gentile. Um, so anyway, uh, as we get ready, we're in the middle of Romans 15, that Paul is saying, I desire to see you, verse 23. I wanted to come to you, uh, so when I go to Spain, I'm going to stop off in Rome to visit with you. That's what he's saying. Right now, I'm going to go to Jerusalem. Um, let's go here in uh, Acts, Acts chapter 27 for just a minute. In Acts 27... Uh, when it was decided that we should sail to Italy, they delivered Paul and some other prisoners to one named Julius, a centurion of the Augustan regiment. Um, you, you may know the story that, that Paul did get to Rome, not the way he thought. He wasn't on his way to Spain. Um, he was arrested, uh, brought before Agabus and Agrippa, and uh, verse one of chapter 27 of Acts, he was taken to, uh, to Rome as a prisoner. But uh, anyway, I wanted to say something here, back in Romans 15. Uh, Paul's trying to be humble. I want to visit with you. I, you know, I want to, uh, verse 24, I want to, uh, how do you say it? I want to, uh, I, I want you to help me on my journey. I want to stay with you. Maybe you could put me up for a little while. I want to enjoy your company. Um, but, you know, if anyone did have a reason to boast, it was, it was probably Paul. Look, look, look at uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, uh, because this is an interesting little chapter too. Hey, Gary Feldman's here from New Jersey. Hey, Gary, God bless you. Glad you're on here tonight. We prayed for you and Joanne already. So for, uh, 2 Corinthians 12, verse 1, It is doubtless not profitable for me to boast. Very true. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, whether in the body I don't know, or whether out of the body I don't know, only God knows, such a one was caught up to the third heaven. He's speaking about himself. Um, I know such a man, whether in the body or out of the body. I don't know. I don't know what happened, but only God knows. But he was caught up into paradise and heard inexpressible words, which is, it is not even lawful for a man to say. Of one, uh, I will not boast. I'm sorry. Of, of such a one, I will boast. Yet of myself, I will not boast, except in my infirmities. For though I might desire to boast, I will not be a fool. For I will speak the truth, but I will, but I refrain, lest anyone should think of me above what he sees me to be or hears from me. And lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. Wow. Wow. Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart, and the Lord said, no, my grace is sufficient for you. So Paul had these fantastic spiritual experiences <clears throat> and saw multitudes come, <clears throat> come to the Lord through him, perform miracles, and so forth. But in verse 17, 18, 19, he does not want to boast. He does not want to say what he did. He wants all the glory to go to God. And uh, I think that's so powerful and such a powerful lesson that we could learn. Uh, I hear so many preachers and teachers and Christians, how can I say, they just brag on themselves. They do. I hate to say it like that, but they do. And maybe they don't know any better. Maybe their self-esteem is so low that they have to do something to build themselves up. But the biblical way is to let God build you up. Let other people build you up. Let other, you know, let other people, whatever. You know, God will give you what you need. Uh, your strength comes from the Holy Spirit, not from people. And so I, don't, I think Paul gives a really good example here. Uh, so verse number 20, 
he says something really, really interesting. We're going we're to stop at verse number 20. He says, So I have made it my aim to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named, lest I should build on another man's foundation, as it is written, to whom he was not announced, they shall see, and those who have not heard, they shall understand. That's from Isaiah uh, 52, verse 15. That was verses 20 and 21. So Paul says this. He says, look, I, I've made it my position. I'm, I'm not going to preach where somebody else already preached. I'm going to go somewhere else. That's why he had all these mission trips. He, he, he went to different places where no one heard the gospel. He really had a missionary's heart to do that traveling and, and share the word of God. But verse number 20 has some ramifications for us today. Uh, for instance, uh, Haverhill has 37 churches plus several parachurch organizations. Parachurches are churches that are, I mean, uh, ministries that are supported by churches um, that do a work that most churches don't do. For instance, like Leaving the Streets Ministry is a parachurch. Uh, Common Ground is a parachurch. Um, Pregnancy Care Center is a parachurch. Uh, Somebody Cares New England uh, new Brothers. Uh, these ministries deal with the poor, they deal with food, they deal with uh, pantries, they deal with uh, counseling, they deal with clothing, and all that kind of stuff. Prison work, aftercare. So, so you have 37 churches plus all these parachurch organizations. And, uh, you know, about... About 10 years ago, we've been here, what, 13 years? About 10 years ago, I was here for about two years, another Assembly of God church came by, and they had every intention of planting another Assembly of God church in Haverhill. And so I thought of this verse, you know. Um, And so I met with the pastor, and he showed me where. It was in the Acre area of Haverhill downtown, uh, highly concentrated area, a lot of poverty. Uh, and it would have been not a, not a traditional church, and it would have been a non-traditional church, much like um, Christian Community Fellowship, or not much like the Cafe Ministry on Sunday morning, or Just Church is another uh, church in downtown Haverhill. In other words, um, non-traditional. Um, very low expectation regarding dress code. <laughs> you know, just get there, basically. Uh, many people might be homeless. Uh, they may have been up all night. They may be poor. They may be disenfranchised. Um, the one that was being discussed was going to be a dream center where the church would be primarily responsible to give food and clothing and, you know, care for people, which is great. You know, I, I, was, I supported it, actually. Uh, But at the last minute, they decided not to do that because they realized there were several things in Haverhill already that were going on. But but what I wanted to say was many years ago, probably, well, not that many, maybe maybe 10 or 15 years ago, there was an unwritten policy with, well, it may have been written uh, within the Assemblies of God, that you, it wasn't ethical to plant another Assembly of God church within a six mile radius of the existing Assembly of God church. So that was the general rule for, you know, a hundred years or so. Uh, so the idea was for that one church to reach as many people in their, that, that six mile circumference as possible. And if another church could be established in another community, 10 miles away, whatever, 20 miles away, um, that would be fine. But to let the, let the one AG church do what it's supposed to do without interference, well, that rule went out the window. And now... Now, no one says anything. If if anyone wants to start an AG church in downtown Haverhill, they would be able to do that. Uh, Hopefully, we would work together on that. But it probably would be like a different emphasis, a different people group they would try to reach. But anyway, here in Haverhill, there's 37 churches. 
And you have, you have like, like our church is basically a, a traditional Pentecostal church, uh, whereas we, as a matter of fact, uh, because of the type of people that we attract, are able to support many of these parachurch, in fact, I think we support every one of them, um, th these parachurch organizations that are reaching the poor, re <clears throat> reaching the disenfranchised, reaching the drug addict and so forth. Um, so because of churches like ours, where people, not that we were, we're, we're rich, but we do understand the principles of tithing and giving, uh, we're able to give out of our, what we have, we give to others that they could do work that we probably couldn't necessarily do. But there, is, there are many other churches in town that don't do what we do. Uh, they're very traditional, steeped in tradition, uh, very kind of stoic, not Pentecostal, not even evangelical. They're just traditional. And uh, it's a formality, and uh, in my estimation, they're not they're not making a whole lot of difference. But uh, I'm just saying, uh, Paul made it a point; he didn't want to go where anybody else was. Uh, so that that makes me think, like, wow, we should plant a church up in Plastow. Now there are good churches up in Plastow, not AG churches, but there are some good churches up there. We should plant a church in Lawrence. I, I've been saying that for a long time. Lawrence, how many people live in Lawrence? About 100,000 people? There is an Assembly of God church, but it's a uh, Spanish Assembly of God. There's not an Anglo Assembly of God church in Lawrence. That's amazing to me. There should be one, in my opinion. Um, so yeah, there's so much work to do. <laughs> there's just so much work to do. Uh, so we need people to get plugged into this church so that we could get our forces there. Now, historically, our church... Uh, for the, some of the newer people on here, uh, historically, since I've been here, I've been here 13 years, we have, gee, we have routinely uh, taken people in. People become committed here. They, they, they work with us. You know, they join with us. They're members. Um, and after a couple of years, they feel the burden to go off and do their own work. And we, we, we spent, you know, we have sent people to youth ministries, uh, young adult ministries, the mission field, uh, pastoring their own churches, uh, some in the area. There's probably there's probably like seven or eight, maybe nine different people that we've sent out of here to do a work, some far and some nearby. And so that's our calling too. That's what we do. But because we're a church that can handle that, I mean, not many not many churches could handle people coming and then leaving. It leaves a hole in the church, but we have others that fill in the space, which is great. Uh, so just something to think about, the value of a local church. It, it, it is always evolving and emerging, people coming, people going, uh, people being sent out, um, people relocating. We have had several families move during this whole COVID season to different parts of the country. Um, but anyway, I thought it was verse number 20, 15, 20 was interesting. Paul said, I don't want to preach where anyone else has preached. I want to go where no one else has preached. And, and he does talk about the same thing in Corinthians, which I'll wait till next week, where he, he's very careful not to build upon another's work. He doesn't want to get in the way of what, uh, he doesn't want to get in the way of what other, what God is doing through other people. Uh and James, you're absolutely right <laughs> as far as it leads into the whole concept of membership and the congregation's role in the local church. Uh, for instance, one, one way to look at this is most of our people uh, can't go to the mission field. Uh, you know, obviously, it's too far. It's, there's, not, there's a time factor. There's a money factor. <clears throat> but we can give to our missions program here at the church. And through that, we can support uh, what 30 some missionaries at $50 a month, uh, which is really quite a bit of money. Every month we're shelling out of here, but, but it's our mandate from God to go into all the world. So we go to all the world through our missions program. But if you're, not a, if you're not plugged into the local church, you would never get the vision of my heart to do that or the vision of the church to do that because this has been the church's vision from before I got here. Um, so there's a, there's a value of being plugged into the local church um, that sees the bigger picture. Uh, 
You know, we I mean we see the we see the need for missionaries in Haverhill. You know, we support all of the parachurches, um, but we also see the need in India. We see the need in uh, we have missionaries. Uh, where do we have missionaries? Uh, in Africa, in in Europe, in South America, in Latin America, we have missionaries all over the place. So we're trying to do it all, but we need to have a steady flow of people in our church that catch that vision, that are stable people, by the way. Uh, another thing to think about, I know I've got to close out pretty soon. Let me just close with this thought. Uh, there's, you know, many of our people in our church have a burden for downtown, and I do too, for the drug addict, the homeless, the disenfranchised, you know, the troubled soul. I, that's, my, that's my weak spot. However, if we didn't have stable people that are working, have basically good families, they may own a home, they may own a couple of cars, they're doing okay, uh, you know, they're staying out of trouble, the, the, trouble's, not, <laughs> the trouble's not following them, uh, they don't go to court and stuff like that. They're just normal people that are living their lives, but they're saved and they're Christians. We need people like that so that we could do the other things that we're trying to do. And sometimes people forget about that and want all the emphasis to be for downtown. And, and my heart is downtown, but my heart is, is, is also wise enough to realize we can go downtown because we have people from uptown that are supporting the work of our ministry. So on that note, instead of having Hillstock this summer, which we still have some problem with um, our local government uh, reserving the park down there, uh, they're not allowing a GAR park uh, to be used by churches right now. So uh, like our brother Jesus is using Cashman Field, which is over on Hilldale, uh, and that will definitely reach that community for sure. Well, we like to go to GAR Park because it reaches a larger segment of the community, but we can't do that. But I was thinking about this last year too, of having a mini hill stock here in the fall in our parking lot, uh, not to attract those from downtown per se, but to attract our neighbors. There's thousands of people that live right around here. They drive by the church every day. They see our sign out there every day. Um, and sometimes people come in. They see the sign and they come in. But I would love to have something going on here that would attract... I mean, up, we have so many neighbors. Uh, it, it's really uh, a busy area, this northern side of Haverhill. But what can we do to attract those people that live around here that are working faithfully? Uh, they have um, people are, are working. They're, they're, you know, buying their homes and their cars and they're stable. And, uh, but they need the gospel. They need the gospel. You know, we can't neglect anybody. Everybody needs the gospel. So anyway, uh, I'll, I'll close with that. Let me just see a couple of responses here. Let's see. Uh, James, appreciate your comments. Sandy, never known a church like, like New Life, who shows so much love. And thank you, Sandy. And I'm so glad you're a part of it. Sandy, how many years have you been here now? I want to say three or four, but I, I don't know. Uh, yep, Maria. Okay, Eva, New Life is unusual because of the pastor who sets the tone. Thank you, Eva. Love you, too. Uh, Jerry says, pray on that. Yeah, you know, some of our regular musicians from Hillstock over the years were on Facebook. I think, James, they commented to you. Uh, it was Seed. It was uh, our dear sister that leads in worship. I can't think of her name right now. Um, I don't know if Santos had said something. Uh, the other, the, the rapper... Mr. Positivity, those guys, uh, how they miss Hillstock. You know, they love coming up here to minister at Hillstock. And uh, what a tremendous effort it was. We may show a video clip of that. James, maybe you could find it, and we'll post it on our church page. It's just a Hillstock wrap-up from last year, just so people know what it's all about. But anyway, uh, we got to close. <laughs> um, can we pray for our son, Jeffrey, uh, for his birthday today, for his year? And... Um, we covered everything else, I think, pretty good. All right, so let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for your word today. Thank you for Romans 15. And thank you for the example that Paul gives us about humility and uh, 
and sincerity and in, uh, in proclaiming, proclaiming the Word of God and helping the church to stay on track. Father, I pray that you help me be a good pastor, help Pamela be a good uh, pastor's wife and, and co-leader in the church, uh, be with Pastor Bill as well and all of our leaders. And uh, we just pray for your anointing as we go forward. Give us the guidance and wisdom we need to reach our community, even those in this neighborhood. We pray that we would have uh, insights and inroads into the people that live right around the church uh, that drive by here every single day. We do pray, Lord, for the uh, Leaving the Streets ministry on Saturday to, to uh, be effective, to uh, produce good results of salvation. And uh, we pray that all their needs are met. And Lord, we also want to pray for Jeffrey Amendola today, turning 38 years old. Bless his health, bless his business, bless his family, his children, and um, his business, Lord. Bless him in every aspect and uh, let him know most of all how much you love him and how much his family loves him too. Let him have a great day, a great night, and a great year this year in every aspect. So we thank you, Lord. We give you all the praise, and we pray your blessing upon our lives now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Listen, if you need to be baptized, let us know. We're doing it uh, this Sunday night. Stephanie Morin, that's right. Paris Fisher, that's right. Um, oh, I missed a lot of comments. Sorry about that. Okay, very good. All right, I'll take a minute to respond. Thank you, James, for that. I love you, and uh, so glad that you're all here tonight. Uh, remember, Sunday is Teen Challenge. Invite a friend that needs to come. Uh, the guys will be sharing their testimonies and singing and sharing the word. It's going to be a great day. All right, God bless you. See you soon. Bye-bye.